Ladies and gentlemen, today we talk about thermal energy, like here in the sauna, there is a lot of heat in it. So the question is, is there a way to produce energy, useful energy out of this heat? And the answer is no in a certain sense, and that's what we will learn today. So this is the 27th lecture on the course on understanding the bigger energy picture. I haven't done a lecture for a long time now, and now we continue the series. Today it's about energy, entropy and exergy and probably at least the word entropy you know from school and maybe you have never really understood what entropy is so I will try to explain it to you today in a way that you will never forget it again. So what is it about? Let's start from the beginning some basics physics which we have to do to understand what really thermal energy is. So you all know from the previous lectures, especially lecture number 18, if you go back to that, we learned that if you want to do some work, you have to have energy. And energy appears in many different forms, like we have nuclear energy, motion energy, rotational energy, and so on. And of course, also heat is a form of energy. So what is this thermal energy about? In the lecture number 18, we learned that there's a law of nature who says that energy is always conserved. So the total energy of a confined system is constant. So you can change the forms of energy inside of the system, but as long as there's no energy coming in or out, the total energy will not change. So let's go to the basic quantity, which is the thermal energy. It normally gets the letter Q. You could also give it the letter E for energy, but people uh, used to give the thermal energy a special letter because thermal energy is different compared to many other forms of energy. If you talk about thermal energy, you also have to talk about temperature. You should not mix up these two. Temperature is the state of some material, so a material can be cold or hot, so it has low or high temperature. It also has energy, thermal energy. And how much energy it has is related, of course, to the temperature. And the formula is shown here. If you increase the temperature of some material, for example here we have a cup of coffee. So if the coffee gets hotter, it has more energy. And the energy change is called delta Q, so the change in thermal energy. And this is proportional to the delta T, which is the change in temperature. If you heat up your coffee by 10 degrees and then by 10 degrees again, you need a certain amount of energy for the first step and you need the same amount of energy for the second step. So energy adds up and the more energy you put into a material in form of heat, the higher the temperature gets. And of course, it's also proportional to its mass or to the number of atoms inside of your material. So if you have two coffees which you heat up, you need twice the thermal energy. Between the energy and the temperature, there's a relation which depends on the kind of material you have and the constant which you have to add in here in order to get an equation out of this proportionality is 4.2 kilojoule divided by kilogram and degrees of Celsius. But as you are not physicists, we don't go into formal details here. Instead, you get an example here from one of the previous lectures where you see in concentrated solar power you produce heat. And this heat is used here to heat up a storage tank. It contains liquid salt and you heat it up to 390 degrees Celsius. And because of the high temperature and because of this huge volume of liquid salt which is in there, you can store quite a lot of energy in there. And this energy you can later use to produce electricity at night when there's no sun shining. So let's talk about the question how do you produce useful energy out of the heat. For that you need an engine which is able to do that. One of these engines is called a Stirling engine. I have a small one here in my hand. In the old days, it started with steam engines to convert heat into electricity or into motional energy. People 
heated up water, they produced steam, and the steam went into a steam engine and produced motion there. A more sophisticated machine is the Stirling engine. I'm not going to explain you the details how it works. I just want to show you a few very important aspects of the conversion of thermal energy into other kinds of energy, which is very important and which depends on general physics laws. I'm going to show you now how the thermal energy of the coffee is now converted into mechanical work. This this Stirling engine. For that, I just place it on the top of this hot cup and then the lower metal plate gets hot. And if I start the machine, it starts to run faster and faster. So obviously, this is not a perpetuum mobile, but this is really a machine which converts the heat of the coffee into a motion energy. Just like a steam engine, it also contains a piston which goes up and down by expansion of air and by the contraction as a circular process. And then the piston converts it into mechanical work. If you look inside of the cup, you see that actually I didn't use coffee but hot water, but the principle is the same. Now we need a few more formula to understand this Stirling machine. So the Stirling machine, as I said, converts thermal energy, heat energy into motion energy. For that, which I didn't tell you yet, it needs not only heat, not only thermal energy, it also needs a temperature difference. And actually, if you do the calculations, you find out the temperature difference is essential to make the machine run. So it's not enough to have the hot coffee, you also need the cold air outside, otherwise the machine doesn't work. Actually, the efficiency of such a machine is calculated according to a relatively simple formula here. You take the difference of the hot and the cold part of the machine, so in the difference of the temperature of the coffee and the outside air. You divide it by the temperature of the coffee and you subtract the absolute temperature zero from this temperature. The absolute zero is the coldest possible point in physics. It's minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. Nothing in the universe is colder than that. It's also called zero Kelvin if you use the physics unit Kelvin instead of degrees of Celsius. So what do we learn? We learn that such a Stirling engine, it's also called a Carnot circle, uh, has an efficiency which can never be bigger than the one given by this formula here. The same formula is true for any other machine which converts heat into mechanical work. So what always counts is the temperature difference. Now we could think about producing a temperature difference without having a hot coffee. And this I will show you in the next experiment, which is coming here. So again, we have our Stirling engine. And this time I just put it on the table without any heat. So the lower plate has room temperature. And on the top now I put ice, yeah? small cubes of ice at zero degrees Celsius. And now let's see if also this experiment will work. So I place three or four pieces of ice. And then if, if I start the engine, then you see slowly it also starts to work. It starts first a little bit slow because the plate, the top plate has to get cold first. But when this is quite cold, then the machine runs. So where does the energy come from, which is running here? Well, again, it cannot be a perpetuum mobile. The energy has to come from somewhere. And of course, it cannot come from the ice because the ice has very little thermal energy. Actually, the machine runs from the thermal energy of room temperature. Okay, so the room temperature is the heat which is heating up the lower plate. And this room temperature is enough to run the machine. As I explained you before, you need a temperature difference, otherwise the machine doesn't work but the energy comes from room temperatures. The room temperature has enough energy to run such a machine. Then of course the question is, can't we just use the room to run machines to produce electricity? And the answer is no, you need a hot and a cold side to run a machine. 
without a temperature difference it doesn't work and I show you that in the next experiment here. So this time I have again the machine running with ice and room temperature and now I place the machine on top of a second set of ice cubes and again it's working but if we observe it long enough we find out that it's getting slower and slower. What is happening? Well, at the beginning, the lower plate was still at room temperature, which had a lot of energy still to run the machine. But as soon as the lower side got cold, the temperature difference between upper and lower plate disappears and then the machine stops running. So we see now the machine is slower and slower and stops to run. This, as I explained to you before, has to be like that because a machine always needs a temperature difference. Now we have understood already quite a lot about thermal energy and how to make use of it. And now we come to entropy and a very important additional phenomenon. So imagine again you have an espresso at for example 40 degrees Celsius and you have a glass of cold water at 0 degrees Celsius, so it's ice water. If you put the two together, what is happening? Well, if it's the same amount of liquid, it will have the average temperature, which is 20 degrees Celsius. And from that, of course, we can confirm that energy is confirmed. We have a certain amount of thermal energy in the cold water. We have more amount of energy in the hot espresso. And if you put that together, you have the sum of the two energies, which gives you twice the mass, but only at 20 degrees Celsius. I can do this experiment for you. So let's take an espresso. This time it's a real one. Put it into a glass of cold water. So what is happening? First of all, the coffee and the water is mixing. Yeah? The brown espresso and the colorless water are mixing together to one liquid. The next thing is, which I don't measure here now, but you can do it at home if you don't believe it, the temperature of the two is becoming the average temperature of them. So it is not as hot as the espresso anymore, but it's not as cold as the cold water anymore. So two things are happening here. The two liquids are mixing and the temperature gets to a common equilibrium. So why do I tell you that? Why is that so important? Well, the point is that if I run my Stirling engine on the espresso, it will run for some time and can produce some amount of energy. If I run my Stirling engine on the icy water, it will also run for a certain amount and will produce a certain amount of energy. So the upper two liquids can be used to produce, for example, electrical energy. But the mixed water of 20 degrees Celsius has just the same temperature as the surrounding and no machine will be possible which could convert the energy in the coffee, in the mixed coffee, uh, into electricity. So that is something very important which you have to learn. Due to energy conservation, the upper and the lower states have the same amount of energy, but the upper state with the two different liquids at different temperatures can be used to produce electricity or other forms of energy, whereas in the lower liquid it's not possible to use this thermal energy anymore. So what we learn now is Energy is the ability to do some work, but not all forms of energy can be used to you do some work. So energy is conserved, but we can convert it into thermal energy in a way that you can never make use of it anymore. And that is finally also the dilemma why you can't build a perpetuum mobile. So even though there is energy, there's no way to have a machine running for an infinite time. So the energy is conserved, but it becomes useless under certain circumstances. And for that, the physicists have an extra 
expression, they introduced the quantity which is called exergy, and exergy is defined as the part of the energy which can be converted into work. So exergy is the useful part of the energy. Energy alone is not enough. The other thing which we learned from mixing the coffee with water is that mixing is irreversible. There is no way that you take this big glass of cold coffee and make out of that a glass of ice water plus a hot espresso. Even though it would not violate any energy conservation, this is never possible. And to really understand why these things are irreversible, you need the quantity which is called entropy, which you might have learned in school and which you probably never liked. So entropy is a physics quantity which is quite hard to really understand it, but still you should know what it is good for and the basic law about entropy which says that entropy over time always increases and never decreases. So what is it about? We go back again to the two different liquids. If you mix different liquids, you increase the disorder of these liquids. Before you had something brown and something colorless, and afterwards you have a mixture which is not ordered anymore. And or before you had a high temperature and a low temperature, and afterwards you have a mixture, so there's no order anymore between a hot and a cold part of the liquid. And for this disorder which you increase by mixing things, you define the quantity entropy, which is usually given the letter S, and entropy is something which comes from thermodynamics. The units of entropy is joule per Kelvin, so it's energy divided by temperature. It has something to do with the energy at a certain temperature. And the basic law of physics says entropy always rises with time. If you have a closed system, there's no energy coming in or out from the outside then in this closed system the entropy will always increase, there's no way to decrease it. To understand that a bit better, I have here a simulation of atoms where you can see what happens if coffee and water is mixing. This simulation is coming from the University of Colorado and I can only um, propose that you go to this link and try to play with all the many simulations they have on this web page. With these simulations, it's really much easier to understand physics. So I use a simulation about diffusion, that is how chemists call the process of mixing of gases or also of liquids. And in this simulation, I do the following now. So let's have two boxes. The left box has a certain amount of particles in and the right box has an, also a certain amount of particles in. On the left side now we put 30 blue particles in and on the right side 30 red particles. The blue particles have a temperature of 50 Kelvin. The red particles get a higher temperature, so they are faster, they are moving faster. They have 500 Kelvin. And now I take away the divider between the two boxes and now the molecules move randomly like before, but just by accident they now go also to the other side. And after some time they are completely mixed. The red and the blue are mixed together and if we wait long enough it will still not happen that all the red particles go on one side and all the blue particles go on the other side. The other effect is that the temperature mixes as well because the Fast particles hit the slow particles, the slow get faster and the fast ones get slower. And this time after some while uh, both particles have the same speed and having the same energy means having the same temperature. So what happened here again in this diagram you see that we started with two boxes where the two boxes here on the left have an order in their atoms. The red and the blue ones are ordered and the high temperature ones are the red ones and the low temperature ones are the blue ones, they are also ordered. This high degree of order means a low entropy because entropy is a measure for disorder. So if there's almost no disorder because everything is ordered quite well, then the entropy is small. 
but it has a large exergy, so if you would run a Stirling engine on that, in each of the boxes you could produce electricity from the temperature of the atoms. Now we open the divider and the atoms move as shown on the right side. They get completely randomized, the temperature equalizes, and that means over time the entropy increases. At some point it has a maximum entropy when it's completely mixed and the temperatures of the two colored atoms are the same. The exergy now is zero because you cannot run the Stirling engine anymore in this box. But from the energy conservation we know that on the right side has the same energy as the left side. So the final temperature of the mixture is just the average temperature of the right and the left side. So the same here again for the coffee. The mixture of the espresso and the cold water means this energy is conserved. But now the coffee has the maximum entropy and its exergy is zero and we cannot run our machine on it anymore in time. So now coming back to the first picture again. If you are sitting in a sauna, it's hot from all sides. Everywhere is a lot of energy from all sides. There is heat waves coming to you. But it doesn't matter how hot it is. It doesn't matter how much energy there is. There is no way to produce energy from this heat if you are sitting inside of the sauna. So this is the essence of entropy. If entropy is too large, there is no way to do any work anymore. In one of the next lectures, we will learn something about heat pumps and heat pumps make use of these expressions of entropy and energy and they use it in a very clever way and in the way how the heat pumps use energy it looks as if they have efficiencies which are much larger than 100% and that is something which we should use in future for heating our houses because if you can use electricity with an efficiency of larger than 100%, up to 500%, for example, then you can produce a lot of thermal energy without having a big electricity bill. But this will come in one of the later lectures. The next lecture I will first talk about what is called sector coupling, which has to do with the link between power, mobility and heating. Thank you and see you next time. Goodbye. Thank you.